tribal trails, tribal trails. The Son of God, He is near. He chose to walk. Hi, and welcome to Tribal Trails. I'm glad that you're spending this half hour with us to learn more about what God has been doing in our world. Do you know that one third of the Bible is prophecy? The prophets in the Bible often use the term the last days to describe God's dealings with his chosen people. Our guest today is David Dunn. He is going to share his thought on this topic. When I think of the last days, I cannot think of it without uh, thinking of Israel because Israel is central to everything that happens in the last days. Okay. Uh, Israel is actually the, uh, the timepiece, the um, sundial mm -hmm. uh, the, okay. for determining the time, the hours of the day uh, that God has used to explain what he's going to do in the world in the last days. Now we need to remember that most of the Old Testament passages call the last days the latter days. And the New Testament uh, essentially always talks about the last days, but it's the same idea, just two different languages expressing it. What God has done is to uh, give through his dealings with the people of Israel uh, a very clear understanding with, with no distortions, no no uh, hiccups that uh, can occur if we believe God's word and if we, as uh, the prophet Isaiah describes it, if we tremble at God's words. And uh, uh, to me, that means we take God's word seriously. Uh, if we take his word seriously, uh, Israel is still in God's program right to the end of time. And I want to take you to a passage that is sometimes the most confusing uh, passage for many, but it, uh, it, it has a simple explanation to it if you stay away from the real details. If you get too detailed, it becomes more yes. wonderful, but it also becomes more complex right. and somewhat more confusing. Uh, I'm thinking of Daniel chapter 9. Daniel was taken as a captive into Babylon uh, by Nebuchadnezzar in the year 605 BC. He stayed there the rest of his life, and he became one of the most trusted non-Babylonian and non-Persians uh, in the empires of the Babylonians and then the Persians later on. He moved right up to the top next to the king. Uh, and he was a godly and righteous man. And Daniel became a very good personal friend of Nebuchadnezzar. And when Nebuchadnezzar was stricken with um, insanity for a period of seven years, Daniel was second in command. And uh, when a world uh, empire leader like that becomes insane, Usually there's a coup and a new government takes over. The historical records show all of Nebuchadnezzar's campaigns uh, through his life. Yeah. And the reason that he was stricken with insanity was because he boasted too much. And God reminded him, you're not in charge here, I am. And he struck him with insanity. He gave him a warning first, which Daniel begged him to pay attention to. And he lost it one time and boasted about his magnificent city of Babylon, which he had built and immediately God struck him with the threat that he had made. And, and he became what is called a boanthropic being, uh, a, a human thinking that he's a beast. And in the historical records, there is a seven year period mm -hmm. of silence where Nebuchadnezzar in the historical records did not write a thing about himself, not a peep. You say, is that accidental? I said, no, it's not. It's this affirmation of what the Bible says. For seven years, he was removed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the only way that we could possibly understand that he was able to return to his throne was that Daniel had kept his throne for him. A man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. With that in mind, uh, we think of Daniel in Babylon. He realizes as he's been reading the writings of Moses uh, in his copy of the Torah, that uh, the reason that they're in Babylon, because Moses explained it very clearly, said, if you disobey, if you go after other gods, if, if you do not keep the covenant, if you turn away from the commandments, God is going to take you and pluck you off the land. He's going to scatter you among the nations of the world. He describes in the first part of Daniel chapter 9, it dawned on him that this is why they were in Babylon. 
And also he had promised them through the prophet Jeremiah, who was still living in Jerusalem, it uh, had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, um, we have this wonderful prophet living there, kicking around among the ruins of the city of Jerusalem and writing the book of Lamentations over oh. there. But uh, God gave him a revelation to send to Daniel and the rest of the exiles saying, after 70 years in Babylon, you're going to be allowed to return. So that was a promise made to the southern kingdom uh, who had been taken captivity by the Babylonians. It did not have direct reference to those that had been taken uh, captivity by the Assyrians uh, in the year 722, but these that had been taken captive as of 586 when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple in Jerusalem and destroyed the city. It was eventually rebuilt uh, by uh, Nehemiah who rebuilt the walls. But uh, Daniel was reading and he describes that it, he understood he got understanding, he got excited. He understood that they were there because they had sinned. They were there for a certain period of time before God would allow them to go back by working in the heart and mind of the ruler of the nation that they were under at that time. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. That's the background, so Daniel began to pray. He really prayed, and you can read the, the, his prayer, and, and he begged God. And he, he said, according to your righteousness, O Lord, please move now. And then we're told that as he was praying, verse 21, while I was speaking in prayer, a man, Gabriel, and we understand that's the angel Gabriel, appeared to him. He was caused to fly swiftly. He touched Daniel at the time of the evening oblation, and he informed me, the angel Gabriel informed me and said, he talked with me and said, Daniel, I am now come forth to give you skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth and I am come to show thee for you are greatly beloved. This is God's word to Daniel through Gabriel. You are greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Now, uh, from this point on then, Gabriel gives what is understood to be the greatest uh, end time chronology. It's called the 70 weeks uh, of uh, God's program through Israel. Israel is there right to the end. He said 70 weeks, or the, the word is 70 sevens. Oh. Uh, that's, that's the Hebrew word for week is seven. 70 sevens are decreed upon thy people, who were Daniel's people? Israel. The, that's right, Israel, the Jews. The Jews. The Jews were Daniel's people. These are decrees that are concerning the Jews, the Jewish people, Daniel's people, and upon thy holy city. Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the holy city of Daniel. And you cannot interpret what comes the, uh, in the rest of these verses correctly by ignoring Israel or Jerusalem. These are decrees from God's blueprint of the ages that have Jerusalem and the Jews at the center of what he is doing. So everything that we say from this point on, think Jewish. Okay. And uh, the 77s uh, is uh, a recognition of the fact that each of the period of sevens is uh, a time frame of seven years. So 70 periods of seven years is 490 years all told. Uh, and of course, uh, Daniel was receiving this at a particular point in time uh, in the, um, uh, he had been taken captive in 605, the end of the seventh century. In the beginning of the sixth century, he was in captivity and this came to him. Now there are six things that God is going to accomplish in this time frame of 490 years. Uh, and all of these are with regard to the Jews and Jerusalem. The first was, he said, uh, to finish the transgression. Now think transgression of the Jewish people, okay? okay. To finish the transgression of the Jewish people. Secondly, to make an end of sins. Question comes up immediately, what's the difference between transgression and sin? I, I can't take time to deal with that. But what sins? The sins of the Jewish people. Okay. okay. Thirdly, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Whose iniquity? What iniquity? The iniquity of the Jews. Okay. Those first three things that God is going to accomplish during this time frame 
all relating to the Jewish people, you'll notice that they all have to do with the question of sin. Right. It's going to deal with their spiritual problem. For Jerusalem stumbled and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. And now the next three move beyond in, in a very real sense, and we understand that there are details here that we're not touching on. But the fourth is that he will make reconciliation for iniquity of the Jewish people. And you and I understand that he's also done the same for the Gentiles. Right. But he's talking about the Jews. He has yep. made reconciliation for them to bring in everlasting righteousness, which is what God is working to do. Uh, in, in world history. We certainly understand that that uh, is talking about the reign of David during the time period of the millennium and then on into oh, okay. eternal state where righteousness will be all there is, there will be no sin. And then to seal up vision and prophecy, everything that the prophets had recorded by way of prophetic uh, statements about what would happen in the end, all the visions that they had had from God, everything is going to be completed. And I could take you to a passage in the book of Revelation where it says that all prophecy is completed during the 70th seven, which is what the book of Revelation is all about. Right. And then lastly, to anoint the most holy. That's the sixth thing that God is going to accomplish in this period of 490 years. To anoint the most holy is to anoint the kadosh kadoshim. Uh, kadosh, Kadoshim, Kadosh is singular, Kadoshim is plural. They both mean holy. And so he says to anoint the holy of holies, which is the, the Hebraic way of expressing the most holy place. The most holy place on earth uh, was in the inner part of the temple that was built by Solomon and, and then later after this to be rebuilt by Zerubbabel. It was where the throne of God sat and, and where the Ark of the Covenant sat and where uh, in the future God is going to uh, dwell on that very spot, the, the Holy of Holies. And of course, this has to do with the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the holy city, but in, in the city of Jerusalem is a, a most holy place. And that's where God's throne is going to sit. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Now, with that in mind, uh, we read after that, it says, know therefore and understand. Uh, the angel wanted Daniel to have full understanding that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem uh, until Messiah the Prince shall be seven sevens or seven weeks and three score and two weeks. In other words, 69 weeks. They put the seven sevens and the 62 sevens together, 69 weeks or 483 years in, in common terminology. And during this time period, it says the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Now, as of 586, Jerusalem was destroyed. The streets were gone. The wall was gone. Everything was gone. And uh, God says now, during this time period of 69 weeks, all of that is going to be restored. The 69 weeks have a starting point and they bring you up to a terminal point where it actually is finalized. And the starting point is this, it says, Daniel, understand this, that from the going forth of the decree or commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem after it's been destroyed by the Babylonians. Now you say, okay, there must be a decree somewhere where somebody gave permission for the Jews to return to rebuild their temple and also their city walls. There are three decrees that are known only one of those decrees, uh, certainly one of the decrees was for Zerubbabel to go back and rebuild the temple. But uh, that does not mention the walls. Uh, there is one decree that allows the people to go back to rebuild the temple and the walls. And that's the decree that was given uh, to uh, Nehemiah to give him authority to go back and to rebuild the walls. And that decree has been traced to exactly uh, March the 5th in the year uh, 444. 
in the year 444, the decree was issued uh, and it's recorded in the Bible uh, very, very clearly for us that uh, this decree gave uh, Nehemiah permission to go back. Early the following spring in the month of Nisan, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes reign, I was serving the king his wine. I had never before appeared sad in his presence. So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified, but I replied, Long live the king. How can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. The king asked, Well, how can I help you? With a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, if it please the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. The king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked, How long will you be gone? When will you return? After I told him how long I'd be gone, the king agreed to my request. Now from that point, there's 69... Um, periods of seven years, or 483 uh, Jewish prophetic years, uh, to the end of that time period. And you say, well, what, what does that time period come up to? Uh, it has been uh, searched out in precise detail by scholars that 69 weeks, or 483 years, is 173,880 days. Okay. 173,880. Now you begin with this date of March the 5th in 444, move forward in time, towards our time, uh, by that many days, and it brings you up to a date that we know very, very well, because we celebrate that every year in the Christian church. It's what we call Palm Sunday. Oh. Palm Sunday reflects the day when Jesus rode on the back of a donkey into the city of Jerusalem. He had already wept on the Mount of Olives over Jerusalem, said, I know you're going to reject me. This was supposed to be the day of your fulfillment because Messiah the Prince is coming, but Messiah the Prince will be cut off after this is what Daniel was told. And so as Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem, he was fulfilling this prophecy. And Zechariah had talked about that. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And then it says in verse 26, after three score and two weeks, uh, that's including the seven that is mentioned first, so after 69 weeks shall Messiah be cut off. And it was just a week later. It then says, from that point right through into the 27th verse, tells us everything that is going to happen after Messiah is cut off and crucified. Not for his sins, but for the sins of others. Uh, and what we have is uh, no mention of the Christian church, because they didn't know about the Christian church at that time. But what we have in there is literally 2,000 years of Jewish history during which the prophets told us what would be happening. And this only tells us what is going to happen to uh, the city of Jerusalem and the Jewish people. Uh, and uh, the 26th verse says that Messiah will be cut off, not for himself. The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with a flood. Who was it that came after Messiah was cut off and destroyed the sanctuary? The Romans under Titus oh, okay. in the year 70. The disciples asked that question, when will the temple be destroyed? And then he says, uh, after that, it's going to be wars and desolations upon the city of Jerusalem. Uh, and then it says, and he, who is he? Uh, he is the one who is related to the people who destroyed the temple. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the middle of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it, the city and the sanctuary, desolate, even until the consummation or the completion of everything, the completion of the 77s that we read about in verse 24. 
until what has been decreed is poured out upon the one that makes everything desolate. And now it, it, it's complicated, but it's simple. Yep. Uh, in this uh, 70th week, uh, there's gonna come a prince who is related to the people that destroyed the temple. So we say he's a Roman prince. We don't know who he is yet. We call him actually the Antichrist. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church Thessalonica about the coming of the Lord. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He is going to come. He is going to make a treaty with Israel for seven years. That's the 70th seven, which allows them to reintroduce uh, their sacrificial system on the Temple Mount. Now, the okay. Jews don't uh, do sacrifices. They haven't done it for 2,000 years since the temple was destroyed. But they're going to obviously rebuild their temple, uh, and it will be standing when this covenant is made with the Jews. And then in the middle of that week, he's going to break his covenant. He's going to drive them away from the Temple Mount. And in Jesus' own words, Jesus said, pray that in those days you're not pregnant because you're going to have to flee. Uh, he said, if you are in Judea, flee to the mountains because then there's going to be a terrible, terrible time, which is described in the last part, which has all of these desolations and the consummation that is going to take place on the Temple Mount and in the city of Jerusalem in these 70 uh, year uh, of, the, of the 77s. And so what it means is that 69 uh, of the sevens were completed with the death of, of Messiah. And then you had all these years of the Christian church, during which time, God has scattered the Jews among the nations of the world. The Bible calls them world wanderers. <laughs> they will wander uh, across the length and breadth of the earth, which they have been doing into your lifetime and mine, and now they're returning. But when they do return, then they make a covenant, which allows them to once again make sacrifices on the Temple Mount. The one that makes the covenant with them breaks the covenant in the middle, three and a half years in. Uh, when that takes place, then they have to flee Jerusalem because at that point, um, the prince that shall come, who we call the Antichrist, who the Bible speaks of as the man of sin, he sets up an abominable thing in the temple. And I think that the abominable thing is himself sitting on the throne in the temple in Jerusalem, declaring himself to be God. Read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and you will see him go into the temple, sit on the throne, and order the world to worship him as God. That's terrible. That is the worst blasphemy ever. And that is going to be uh, taking place during the 70th week of Daniel. An entire book of Revelation talks about the Great Tribulation uh, and the terrible things that happen. But if it's, if it's terrible for the world, which it is, yes. it's worse for the Jewish people because they are going to be the specific target of this person that's sitting in Jerusalem uh, and just as the three friends of Daniel were thrown into the fire furnace because they wouldn't bow, the Jews will not bow to this person and say, you are God. And so he is going to seek to kill them and they have to flee. And the Bible tells us that God protects them. This is God's program. It takes us right through until the church is gone. You and I, I believe, are taken away in the rapture. And then this terrible, terrible tribulation time takes place. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Well, it's because the Jews suffer so much during that time. Then the Lord returns to deliver them uh, from their enemies. And then the Lord institutes what we know as the millennium. And we are waiting. If a person understands the gospel and if a person understands that the Lord died for their sins and they understand that God is simply saying, I'm offering to you salvation as a free gift. All you have to do is acknowledge that you're a sinner and that you believe that uh, the blood of Jesus has the power to cleanse you from your sins. If you believe that and if you accept it, then you will not need to go through the tribulation because you will be born again. You'll become a part of the church. And when the Lord returns for the church in what is called the rapture, which takes place before the 70th week of Daniel takes place, because the 77s have to do with Jews, not with Gentiles. And so when the church is removed, 
then the man of sin is revealed and, uh, and a terrible time takes place. The 77s are God's chronometer. And uh, we uh, would say to anybody who does not want to go through those terrible days, uh, we would say, be reconciled to God. Be ready. Be ready.